as you know, those that have been here and those that have been following us on online, that we've been on our sermon series for this entire month titled, If My People. And today's title, which is the fourth part and the last part of this sermon series is, If My People, If My People Turn From Their Wicked Ways. We've been using 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 as our key verse that we've drawn for, from for this um, sermon series. The first, it reads as such. My people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven will forgive their sins, will heal their land. Throughout this whole month, we've been preaching on this verse. And Pastor Cedric brought the first part of it, which was entitled, If My People Call By My Name. He reminded us that God has chosen us to be His people, that we are a chosen few, that he has selected so that he can do his work through us and that we are sons and daughters of a mighty king that we are sons and daughters of a living king that we are sons and daughters of the lord of lords he can pastor Cedric, continue in the second part of the series where it we concentrated on the part where it says if we humble ourselves he reminded us that with a humble heart, God can do amazing things through his people. If we only would humble ourselves and recognize that without God, we cannot do anything. Without God, there is nothing possible. But with God, all things are possible. And last week, our pastor Mike brought us a beautiful sermon from God. And I think one of the most important points in this verse, where it says, if my people would pray and seek my faith, 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 I'm sorry. When we pray, when we go in prayer, we go there not only to ask for things, but in order to praise his name and glorify his name and recognize his name and ask him to, that his presence be felt with us. That we can see his face in our lives. His presence in our lives. Moving in our lives. So when we pray, we pray humbly. Asking God to come and be in control of our lives. To be our Lord and Savior and our God. So that we can be called by his name. Today I have the pleasure of bringing the final part of the series, the final part of this verse. And it says, if my people turn from their wicked ways, if my people will turn from their wicked ways, if my people will leave, leave the sin that is in them, that sometimes we don't even realize that we're sinning. One of the key words in this verse is if. It's a conditional word that uh, requires action in order to affect an outcome. If we humble ourselves, if we pray and seek, if we turn from our wicked ways, then God will do what he wants to do through us. God will then forgive our sins. He will heal our land. But only when we are in obedience to him. We're going to be reading in the book of Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to go from verse 1 to 10. But right now I'm going to read verse 10. 
which says, Render the hearts of these people insensitive, their ears dulled, their eyes dim, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Right here, God is speaking to Isaiah uh, that he should go out and preach the gospel, that he should preach the word of God and introduce God to the people of Israel, although they had ears to hear, although they had eyes to see the greatness that God was doing. Their hearts were not accepting the words of God. They were not ready to accept it. They were, they closed it off. They were, their eyes were dim. Their ears were dulled. And you say, how can this apply to us today? Many a times we hear the word of God, see the greatness of God, but our hearts are not doing what God has requested us to do. And Isaiah understood this. Why? Because he first had to turn to the Lord in order to help the people return to the Lord and to be healed. I'm going to be bringing three points today about turning. The word turn means to change direction, to go in the opposite direction that you're, you're going. So if I'm facing this way, I then turn and go away from that area and go this way. If I'm in darkness and in sin, I turn towards the light who is the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and I walk to him. I turn. It's an action that we have to do in order to recognize that he is Lord of Lords. Another key word is Lord. When we call him Lord, what are we saying? We're saying that he is our master. And when it comes to God, it applies that he's the owner and governor of all all the whole world he is the lord of all above all and of everything isaiah 6 1 reads as such and in the year of king uzal death death i saw the lord sitting on the throne lofty and exalted with a train of his robe filling the temple So, before I get into the meat of this verse, it mentions King Izal's death. Uh, who was King Izal? King Izal was the longest reigning king in Judea. At the age of 16, he became the king of Judea. And he reigned for 52 years. During that time, he followed God. To a certain point. King Izul turned. He turned away from the Lord. He. Did something that. Was a transgression. Against the Lord. He entered the temple. Of the Lord. To burn incense. In front of the Lord. Which is not his right. Was not his privilege. It was not what God wanted him to do. But he chose to do it because he felt that he was the king, worthy of doing these things. And God had chosen men, priests, to do these things in front of his presence because there was a formality to it. There was holiness to it. And he was not worthy to do this. But he misunderstood this. And because he did this, and he entered the temple and burnt incense in front of the Lord thinking he was pleasing the Lord, God struck him with a disease. It's called leprosy. You have heard about leprosy in the Bible. It tears and eats up your skin. People cannot be around you because it's contagious. And it says that King Izal, for his final days, he ended up in isolation by himself. And his death was tragic because he was lonely. 
He was by himself. He did not have the riches or the glory that he once had before, that God had permitted and given to him because he transgressed against God. He turned away from the light and went to darkness. Let us not turn away from the light to seek what is in darkness. Now let us speak of what Isaiah saw in this vision that God gave him. It says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Who sits on a throne but a king? Who sits on a throne but a Lord? The one who commands respect, one who commands dignity and honor and praise and exhortation of his name. One who is empowered. Here we see that the Lord, the most powerful, the most worthy of all praise, King of kings, Lord of lords. Why? Because he was in heaven, in the heavens, on a throne, raining down on this earth. He is the creator of all things. He is wonderful. It says that he was lofty. The word lofty means sublime, supreme, and exalted, elevated, glorified, and praised. Our Lord, when we call on the Lord, our God, we are calling on the most supreme, sublime person, thing, ever. Because before him there was none. After him there will be none. He is the God before all gods. He is the king before all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He is the great creator. That's who we serve. A king that lives forevermore. Although the people on this earth crucified him on a cross and thought it was the end. The enemy thought that was it. We defeated him. He was done. No, he descended into hell was raised again on the third day and ascended to the heavens to sit at that throne next to his father in glory. And because of that, we have victory over all things that come our way. And the verse continues and says that he wore a robe. And that robe, a train, extended out into the temple well this is a great significance to the, the 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 train kings used to wear in that time long trains when they sat on their throne because it represented that that they were important that they were empowered that they were worthy of praise and honor but it never says in the bible that none of those kings train covered the entire area that they sat in. Only one person, our God, his train covers the entire temple. Imagine God sitting up here on the stage, on his throne, and his, his train covers all this area and beyond this area. What does that signify to me? That he is almighty, all powerful, all worthy of all praises and honor. And I can't understand why when we come to our church, we sit here and we do this. We don't express the feeling that we're feeling in our hearts of that joy and peace and tranquility and honor of him and praise his name and glorify his name and say, worthy are you of all praises and honor. Worthy of you of all glory, Heavenly Father, for you are Lord of Lord and King of Kings. When we turn from our wicked ways, when we turn from our sinful ways, then we turn towards where the light is. And who is that light? Our sublime Lord. The splendor of God is reflecting upon us. And we can realize 
that we are sinners, that we need to humble ourselves in his presence, that we have to recognize him as Lord and Savior. And once we do that, he cleanses us, he heals us, he brings us back into restoration uh, with him. Our relationship is built. Verses 2 and 3 reads as such. Seraphines stood above him, each having six wings. Two, he covered his face. Two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Seraphines are angels that are in heaven. And they are described with having six wings. With two of their wings, they cover their face. With two of their wings, they cover their feet, and with two wings, they flew. There's great significance to the covering of the face. If you recall when Moses pleaded with God to see his glory, God responded to him in Exodus 33:20. He said this, but he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. His splendor is so great that we would die if we were in his presence directly looking at him. It's like comparing us to be looking at the sun. If you stare at the sun long enough without any protection, you'll burn your eyes out. You'll go blind. And that's just the sun, something that he created. Can you imagine looking at the face of God directly in his glory and his splendor? We would have to fall on our face and cover our faces in order to render him the praises that he deserves. And it says, even the angels in heaven who do not know sin cover their faces because out of respect, out of honor, they recognize that that splendor was something overwhelming. It was sublime. It says he covers his feet with two other wings. What does that signify, covering your feet with, with your wings? Well, they did this because they were humble. Out of humility, they covered their feet. They're showing that they were humble in front of God. And they had two more wings, and they were flying. They were spreading their wings and moving amongst the heavenly hosts up there, glorifying the Lord's name. This signified that there, were, there was a willingness to serve God. There was a willingness to do what they had to do to serve their God, their Lord. Not only did they use their wings, but they used their mouths to give and bring glory to God. They said, holy, 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 three times. Some say that the reason why they said it three times, because our God is one God, three person in one. Three persons in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, giving honor to each person, one God, one Lord. So when you come to church, don't worry about your friends saying hi to your friends or worrying about what songs are we going to sing. Even if you don't know the words, just start praising God. Holy, holy, holy. Glory, 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 glory to God. Praise God. We give him all honor and glory. Why? Because our hearts should be overwhelmed with his presence when he's here with us. Although we don't see him with our physical eyes, we can feel him through our spirits that he is here. 
I don't know about you this morning. I had to go down to my knees. Why? Because I felt his presence overwhelming me. And I could not stand. I could not stand in his presence. I had to humble myself and go to my knees. He is our king. Verse 4 and 5 reads as such. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voices of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among people who of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. One thing that happens when you turn from your wicked ways and you turn toward the Lord our God and Savior, when you see His splendor, when you see His glory, when that light shines upon you, it's just like a diamond when the jeweler takes it from where it's at, cleans it up, puts it under the light, then he sees all the defects in that diamond. That is what happens with us. When we turn from our wicked way and we submit to the Lord and our Savior, he shines his light on our lives so we can realize the filthiness in us, the uncleanliness in us, our sins in our wicked way so that we can then commence to toss those things to the side and allow him to do what he wants through us. Isaiah, a prophet of God, said, Woe is me! Oh my God! For I am ruined! I'm going to be destroyed! I'm going to die! Because I recognize that I am a, a man of unclean lips. This thing that God has gifted us with sometimes gets us in a lot of trouble. Sometimes with this lips and tongue, we express our inner feelings that are dark and ugly. Like Pastor Ken was saying, we can't speak because... We have our masks, but our eyes are also saying things that are not worthy of God. We are unclean people. We are sinners. We are sinners. I am a sinner. I recognize my fault. I recognize that I am not perfect. I know that every day that I walk, I pray to God that he forgives me for the sins that I know of and the sins that I don't know of. Because there are sins that we commit that to us is nothing, but to others is hurtful. Our tongues speak things thinking that we're edifying and we're actually destroying. Because it's not being guided by the Holy Spirit. It's not being guided by God to express these words to others. Just understand that when God comes into your life when you turn to him all things are changed all things are revealed all things are exposed your most deepest secrets are exposed maybe not to the next person but to you in your heart and then conviction comes in through the holy spirit to convict you of your sins and so that you may change those things so that you may be worthy to be in the presence of god In Acts chapter 3, verses 17 through 26, I'll read them for you. It says, now, And now, brethren, I know that you, you act in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that the time of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send 
sent Jesus of his Jesus the Christ appointed for you whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from the ancient time. And Moses said, the Lord will give, will rise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren to him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it and it will be that every soul that does not heed the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these things these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and the covenant which God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. So we see that because we needed help in turning from our wicked way, the Lord designated his son. His son stepped up and said, hey, dad. I'm willing to go. I'm ready to go. I'm willing to give my life and pay the price for those sinners down there, my creation, because I love them and I care for them and I don't want them to see them in the lake of fire. I want them to be here in heaven with me rejoicing forevermore. I'll go, Dad. I'll go. I'll go. And he descended into heaven, from the heavens to the earth. And as we took communion, we remember what happened at the end, that he went to the cross, he died, he shed his blood, and he gave of himself so that we may be free from our sins, so that we may be able to turn away from our sins and be saved and clean. Turning always from our wicked ways begins when we see the Lord as the Lord. Second point, which I'm leading into, is Turning from our wicked ways is to accept redemption. It's to accept what he did at the cross for you. To understand what he did at the cross for you. Redemption, a price paid for. Redemption of our sins was paid by our Redeemer Jesus Christ at the cross. I'm going to go back to verse 5 and touch on a couple things. It says, then I say, woe is me, for I am ruined. Here, Eliza recognizes he's unclean. Unclean is to be ethically and religious impure. He recognized he was dirty. He, he wasn't worthy to be in the presence of God. That he and the people that were around him were not worthy to be in the presence of God. And that God should not have been with them. But God... In his intimate mercy. And in his intimate mercy provided a way for us to all be clean from our sins. Provided a way that we all can turn away from our sins and receive salvation and receive re redemption through him. That we may re be restored as his children, his creation. In verse 6 and 7. It reads this in Isaiah 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquities is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. So, because Isaiah recognized that he was not worthy, that he was unclean to be in the presence of God, the seraphim did something. He took a coal, a burning coal, and he touched Isaiah's lips. And he says, because we have done this, 
because you have allowed me to do this, you are now forgiven of your sins. When we allow the Holy Spirit to clean our tongue, our mouths, our minds, our hearts, we're giving access to the Lord to cleanse us so that we may speak what He wants to speak through us. It's like a room. Ladies, you will understand this better than some of us men. So you got a room in your house and all that extra stuff that you buy at the store because you think you need it and you really don't need it. You throw it into that room and you fill that room up until you can't even walk into that room. Well, that's the way we do with sin. We allow sin to grow and build up inside of us and build up inside of us to fill our hearts, our minds, and even our, our mouths until it overflows and it's just a lot of clutter. And then one day we decide we have to clean it out. We turn the opposite direction. We say we got to clean that room out because we need to use that room for a better purpose, for a greater purpose. That's when the Holy Spirit comes into your life and he starts plucking. Oh, you like to talk about people behind their back. Oh, you say discouraging things about a person. You don't like the way they look, but you speak to that to another. And instead of praying for that person when they're in need, you're, you're, you're criticizing why they're working. Why can't they find a job? Why aren't they getting an education? That person that walks up to the front, oh, I don't like the way he dressed. He needs to buy new clothes. She needs to buy new shoes. You know, we're looking at the outer appearance and, and criticizing. Criticism sometimes destroys an entire person. And God has not called us to criticize people. He has called us to counsel people. Rebuke people when they need to be rebuked because there is a time to rebuke things. There's a time to correct things by instruction, but with love. And there's a time that we have to humble ourselves and just pray. Just pray about our brother and sister because it is not incumbent in what we do to fix them. Because if we try to fix it, what we're going to do is destroy them. But when we pray to God to fix it, God fixes it and he fixes it perfectly. So when you find yourself in a bind, in a situation where you think that you need to say something to someone and it's, you don't feel it's of God, you, don't, you know it's not God speaking to you, but your flesh trying to correct something, just fall on your knees at that moment and say, Lord, I'm surrendering this to you. I'm surrendering my brother to you. I'm surrendering this situation to you. And I'll... I'm asking God, you take control and you fix it the way you want to fix it. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you that the Lord of Lord, the creator of all things will fix it the proper way. And it, in its time, not in our time, in his, in his time, he will fix it. And you will see that God can glorify himself through that person. Why? Because we turn from our wicked ways. And we surrender it all to the Lord of Lords. And we recognize that we are sinners. Just as my brother is a sinner, I am a sinner. I am no better because I get the privilege to speak the word of God from the pulpit. That I have a title of pastor does not make me better than you. I am just as much a sinner as you. Because today I might be outright, but tomorrow I might be in need of prayer. Because I am flesh, I am human. Until he calls me into his throne, or until he comes again for me, I have to guard my heart. I have to guard my heart to be turning towards him and doing what he wants me to do. Because he is perfection. In Isaiah 45, verses 18 to 25, you may read the entire 18 to 25. I encourage you to do it at your at your leisure. But concentrate on verse 22. It says, Turn me, turn to me and be saved, 
all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. Clearly says it, that he is God, and there is no other. In Romans 3.24, it says this, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Only through Christ Jesus, only through his works, are we saved and redeemed, and we are washed of our sin. Ephesians 1, 7, it reads like this. And in him we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of our transgression according to the riches of his grace. So it all depends not on us, but on him. All we have to do is surrender, and he does the rest. In Acts 10, verse 43, it says this, Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believed in him receives forgiveness of sins. So if you believe, if you truly believe that he is the Lord of Lord and the Savior that came to redeem you, you will receive forgiveness of your sins. Acts 13, 38 and 39. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is free from all things from which you could not be free through the laws of Moses. You are free. You are set free. And don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you that you are not worthy to be free, that you should be in captivity of your sins because the Lord Jesus Christ paid the price on Calvary. And once you accept that, no matter if you fall and slip up a little bit, you know that you can always turn back to him. And he is ready to forgive you and wash whatever wickedness may be in you out if you truly believe that and you truly accept it. So turning away from our sin, it begins by embracing the redemptive work of Christ. Embracing the redemptive work of Christ. That means accepting it, making it yours, being confident in it, and understanding it and knowing it so that you can do the next step, the next thing, the last point, point three, which is turning. To turn is to be willing to go and tell. Willing to go and tell. We find this in Isaiah verses 8 through 10. It says, willing. What is the word willing? To prompt, to act, or respond. A desire to respond to something. So you have to be willing to go when you are called. And verse 8 reads this way. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I, Isaiah, said, Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. Who is willing to, be go, to go? Who is willing to be sent out? To be stretched out? To shoot out like a branch into this world? to preach the gospel, to bring good news to the people, to share salvation with them. Are you willing to go when he tells you to go? He is calling on us, every one of us, to go preach the gospel to every person that may be willing to hear. And even to those that shut their ears. Even to those that don't want to accept it. He says, go. Preach the gospel. I have family members that I've been speaking to day and night for years about the gospel. And it seems like everything I say about the word of God falls on deaf ears. But God says that continue to talk to them. 
Continue to break down those barriers. Continue to destroy that wax that the enemy has built up in their ears so that they don't hear clearly about me. We cannot give up. But once we are willing to go, once we are willing to go, once we have the desire to go, God will instruct us how to go, where to go, and to who to go. Don't be afraid. Sometimes the enemy will say, well, you're a new Christian and you, you don't have much to say because you don't know much about the Lord. But one thing you do know that once you allow God to be your Lord and Savior, that salvation came to your life, that you were forgiven of your sins, and that his love is overwhelming, that he is a splendor Lord, he is the Lord of all lords. And that alone is a message in itself. That alone can touch a heart that is in need of salvation. That is the thing that this world is searching for desperately in the worldly things that they're searching for. I remember when I was not serving the Lord. And I would go out to the nightclubs and I would dance and I would drink and I would think that that would resolve my problems for a minute. It, I forgot my problems because I was so drunk that I couldn't understand anything but loud music, boom, 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 boom. And I'm jumping up and down and, and exerting myself that next morning when I woke up, my problems were still there, and I had a headache. So it even made it worse for me, because the world has nothing good to offer us. Nothing good to offer us. So stop searching in the world for the answer, for the answer is right here in front of you. Open up the Bible and just ask God to take you to where his word is at, that is going to be edifying to you. That could be edifying for others. Ask God to wake you up in the morning at 4 o'clock in the morning to pray for someone that you don't even know. There's been times where I'm awoken and just pray. And I'm praying and praying and tears come to me and I, my heart is hurting. But I don't know who I'm praying for. But God knows who you're praying for. God hears that, 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 that prayer because you're allowing the Holy Spirit to intercede for someone through you. And then later on, you may hear of a brother or a friend that says, Boy, man, just the other day I was going through something, but then the Lord came and he, he just lifted me up about this time of the day. And you'd be like, wow, Lord, you are great. Although I didn't know his need, I was praying for his need. And thank you, Lord, for using me in that way. And God can use you that way. Don't be afraid to be used by God because you are a tool of God. Um, Sister Tawanda, several years ago, uh, before she really got into serving at the church, she came up to me in that foyer. We were, we were just talking. And she's like, I've been challenged to serve in ministry uh, by the pastor, but I don't feel worthy. And I listened to her. And I was asking God, God, please give me words that will encourage my sister. And right there, right there, the Holy Spirit just enlightened me. He says, hey, talk about the pen. Talk about the pen. Hmm. So I said, Lord, give me more. So as I'm telling her, I said, Sister, you're just like a pen in God's drawer. There's many pens, but there's only one of you. One pen. Black. Right? So you are that pen that God's hand, God, takes you to use you. So then what he does is... Right there, you're not useful because nothing's happened. But he ignites the Holy Spirit in you by pressing down on the pen, bringing out what he wants to write, the ink. What is the ink? His word. He starts to write his word and his message out to the person that needs to receive it, be it you or another person. He writes it out. And when he's done with you, he unclicks you. Takes you, puts you back in the drawer, the message is conveyed through you. And then, guess what? He picks Brother Jim, who is a red pen. He picks up Brother Jim to do something else within his ministry. So each person here is like the pen. Allow the Holy Spirit to use you in a mighty way to fulfill his will in your life. And don't think less of yourself because you're not educated. You don't have the word. You haven't been to it. To Bible Institute, you haven't been through a theology class, you haven't really 
gotten deep into the word. You only know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's the only verse you know. Guess what? Repeat that, repeat that, repeat that, because that verse is impactful to save lives. Whatever he gives you, use it to the fullest and understand that he will then grant you more wisdom, more understanding. He will give you words when you think you don't have words. Fear, fear is always there. And understand that fear, I was shaking like a leaf earlier because it's not about what I can bring. It will be never about what I can bring. It's all about what he can bring. I can show you my notes. You're going to say, well, you didn't speak nothing on your notes. You hit the points, but you didn't speak nothing on your notes. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that gives the word to the people according to the need. This message may be entirely different from the next message I give at the 11 o'clock service. Why? Because there'll be different people listening and hearing for their needs. And God will speak into their lives. So are you willing to go? In verse 9 he says, he says, go and tell the people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Verse 10 says, render their hearts of the people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, otherwise they might See with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. So when you find that the message that God is giving you is falling on deaf ear, don't quit. Continue to do what he instructs you to do. Keep taking the word. Because I might be speaking to an audience on the street, and thinking I'm directing my message to this person. But within ear length, there's a person that is in need to hear the gospel. And is listening in intensively to what God is saying to them. I'm directing it to one person, but God is speaking to another. And I had no knowledge of that. And God does something to that person. Turns his heart around so he can see his dirtiness, his uncleanness, and he can surrender it all, all to God and then accept the Lord's splendor as the Lord. He is the Lord of Lord and King of King. He is now my Lord, my King, my Savior, my Redeemer. He is my all. I don't need anything else. I must continue to walk towards him and not turn away from him like King Esau did. He was disobedient. He turned away from him. And because of that, he suffered a terrible death of leprosy. There are consequences when we don't follow what God has instructed us to do. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to go speak on his behalf? Are you willing to do what God has instructed you to do? Turning away from our wickedness requires us, requires us to go and tell. Just because we turn, we can't be like that selfish child that wants the toy for me, me, me. It's my toys. I don't want to share with no one. We can't be that selfish child. We have to be willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. His saving grace, our Lord and Savior. He is just not for me only. He is for you. He died on the cross, not for Jose Torres only. He died for all. For all. That means black, white, Chinese, Spanish, any nationality that is out there. Anyone. What greater time in our history has God afforded us the opportunity to speak into someone's life. Right now, people are more in tune and more alert to hear something positive. 
to hear something good, to hear something that will resolve their issues, that will take their minds away from this COVID? And we have the answer. Why are we sharing it when we can? Go. Do his will. Tell the people that he is Lord. He is King. He is the Redeemer. He is the Savior of this world. He is the answer for their lives. He, as he has done in you, as he has restored you, as he has put joy in your life, as he has put authority into your life, as he has shown you his greatness, you are his vessel. Let that light shine out of you in any form that you can bring it and just let the world know I serve a living king. I serve a living king. He is the answer to all your needs. Without him, you can't do anything. You cannot do anything without him. He is the answer. If my people or called by my name, would humble themselves and turn from their wicked way, then I will hear them from heaven. And then I will forgive their sins. I will hear them. And I will heal, heal their land. So it's very simple. There's no Nothing complete, uh, complex about this situation. If we all turn from our wicked ways and worrying about the things that we cannot control and turn to our Savior and Lord and just say, Lord, it's all in your hand. Do what you want with me. Use me the way you want me. If we do that, if we humble ourselves and let God use us, I guarantee you, I say it with authority. I guarantee you. I guarantee you that God will manifest themselves in your life in a mighty, mighty way. Your families will be saved. Your friends will be saved. Perfect strangers will be saved. Because it is not you, but it's him through you. It is his word through you that causes the effect. If my people would just simply do what I've instructed them to do, then I will show myself mighty in every aspect of their lives and every place that you stand. It doesn't matter where you stand. It doesn't matter if it's at your job. It doesn't matter if it's at the bus stop. It's not, it doesn't matter if it's at you stopped at a, a stoplight and you got your radio blasted with Christian music and you're praising God and someone pulls up next to you and they're looking at you like, ooh, that person's crazy. Yeah, I'm crazy. I'm crazy for Jesus. You know, I'm rejoicing with my Lord. I'm praising my Lord because he is worthy of all my praises because he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the host of hosts. And if the uh, seraphims can praise him in heaven, we must understand that we have to start here praising him because guess what we're going to be doing when we get to heaven? We ain't just going to be lallygagging around talking to our friends. There won't be no time for that. We'll be doing what we were created to do, to glorify his name, to praise his name, to bring him honor. And in his presence, hey, I don't know about you, but it's that little bit of touch that he gives you every now and then and his presence here. We don't see him physically, but we can feel his presence. If you don't believe that he exists, <laughs> start praying and asking him to be in your presence. That you he come and, and that you can be part of his presence. That you can feel his glory. I guarantee you that these walls will tremble. Guarantee you this ground will shake because of his presence. Because my God is a living God. He is not dead. He has risen, and one day he's coming back again for us. For those that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that have not yet turned from their wicked ways, 
I implore you that this day, if you heard the message, that you take a moment to think, I'm living in darkness. There is nothing here. I don't see nothing going on. This is dirty, ugly. I see a reflection behind me. Let me turn towards that reflection, that light, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, and understand that he died on the cross for my sin before I even was born. He died and shed his blood to wash my sin, to carry the price that I should have paid. And because of his redempting grace and his love and mercy and his works, I can be called a child of God. You too can be called a child of God if you accept him and acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior in your life. And then all it takes is you to humble your heart right there where you find yourself. Just close your eyes at this moment and pray this simple prayer. Lord, we come in front of you right now, dear Lord, asking you to remove the wickedness, the sins, the dirtiness from my lives. I turn to you, Lord, as my Lord and Savior. I accept you as my King, my Redeemer. Wash me with your blood so that I too may rejoice in your presence, that I may feel your presence every day that I walk on this earth. Come into my life. Accept me as your child and do your will in my life. Amen. And for those of us that know Jesus Christ, just because we know him doesn't mean that we don't sin sometimes. That we don't slip up every now and then. Because we're human. We're flesh. At this moment, as you turn to him and you ask him and you're in his presence, are you like Isaiah? Woe is me! Woe is me! Cleanse me, Lord, for I'm not worthy to be in your presence. I have failed you. I've sinned against you. I've done something wrong. Forgive me. Just ask God to forgive you, to restore you, to remove it from your life so that you don't repeat it again and again and again. Surrender it completely to him at the cross of Calvary and just leave it there and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you in the path that he wants to use you. And be like Elijah and say, I hear you, Lord. You're calling to see who would go. Lord, your humble servant is here. I may not know much. I may not know how to do a lot. But Lord, whatever you need me to do, please instruct me how to do it and how to do it well for you so that it be pleasing to you and bring you glory. I thank you today for hearing the word of God. And know that he says, if my people, you are his people. If my people, great things can happen. This land will be healed. People will be saved. Tranquility and peace will come to this earth through us if we allow him to use us the way he wants to use us. I want to thank everyone who is continuing to bless us with your offerings as God has instructed you to give. There are five ways to give, the website, the app, physically giving at our giving stations or one of our greeters will accept it for you. You can mail it in if you still haven't uh, 
been able to leave your facility, either mail it in or drop it off at the church. There's a fifth way to give, which is through text at 77977, the word commitment church, one word, 77977. And know, whatever God instructs you to give, he will multiply it, he will glorify it for his purpose, his will, so that people may hear the gospel and may be saved. We thank you. Until next week, God bless you.